like to start today by sharing two observations with you. The first one is that you can discover more about a person in our play than in a year of conversation. And that observation was made by Plato, uh, who had a pretty awesome tutor named Socrates, and they had a lot of conversation. The second thing that I'd like to share with you is this really elaborate diagram back here. For those of you who suffered through getting a graduate degree in education, you probably recognize this as Bloom's Two Sigma problem. And in 1984, uh, Benjamin Bloom observed that if we were able to give every student a tutor, we could move C students to A students. He also observed that if we follow the pattern of mastery learning, that is, where a student stayed on a topic until they mastered it, not just getting a C and getting to move on, that we could move them from being a C student to a B student. And right now in the United States, despite the fact that it's been over 30-ish years since then, we still follow a very conventional model of teaching, whereby an instructor, like we are today, is a sage on the stage, instead of being that really helpful guide on the side that Plato had the benefit of, where we give them a lecture and they do some homework and they take a test. We think maybe it's time to disrupt that. So how do we think here? It's going to work pretty good. All right. In the United States today, we have an agricultural calendar for our school system. We have an industrial model that is, in fact, a picture of a high school and not a factory in North America. And we actually have trained teachers and students to respond to bells and shift work. Word 1812, bell rings, you move on, and you get the periodic table applied to you in the next shift. And we've even managed to take Taylor's principles and apply them to industrializing assessment, driving our assessment of student understanding down to its lowest level. We all know this isn't very effective, right? And in most of our classrooms today, we're still using Stone Age technology. For those of you who haven't thought about it, a chalkboard is two rocks put together to make a mark. Now, to be fair, in the last several years, we have given teachers whiteboards with color markers. <laughs> For real. Some of them even use them. And we've given them interactive whiteboards that we end up using more as glorified slide projectors. So how did we get here? Because we know this current system isn't working. In 1790, when we were starting things out, we were largely an agrarian society. In 1890, when we saw the last real revolution of our educational system, we were ushering in the Industrial Revolution. All of a sudden, we needed to be able to educate masses of people. So that was you know, a pretty good response to the times, and it gave birth to a lot of innovations that drove the 20th century. <laughs> By the time we got to 1990, we didn't have so many people in agriculture anymore. Our, our manufacturing sector was actually on the wane, and we were seeing the blossoming of a technology sector and the services sector. Now, sitting here in this room today in 2012, can any of us imagine what the careers for children will be in 2090? I certainly didn't imagine that when I was in high school, I would eventually have a video game company where I had somebody on my staff whose primary responsibility was social media. That hadn't even been invented yet, right? And the video games that I first had were oh, you know, nobody thought that was going to be a great way to learn. So, how do we get from here, right? This is what's happening in America's classrooms today, to here. When children are born, they're wired to learn through play. This is when they have those aha moments, when they're learning, leaning forward and excited. This is not leaning forward and excited. This is somebody who's being asked to digest material passively and who isn't being actively engaged. We all like this a lot better. And every year that we spend in our formal education system in the United States, it gets worse. We go more and more towards that poor kid sleeping on the desk. In the United States right now, we're failing miserably at educating our children for our current economy, let alone the economy of 2090. 
We ranked 33rd in math, 27th in science, 17th in reading. We all had a Chani, you know, can't read. Then we all remember that, right? We still can't read. We can't add, subtract, multiply, or divide, and we certainly don't know our periodic table. Um, and we've worked systematically to drive creativity out of our curriculum. So, this is the wonder of childhood, right? A child's first teacher is play. Many of you here today are parents, and you all got to teach your children how to use utensils. They sat in a high chair and were so proud and you gave them that spoon and you showed them how to take the spoon from their hand, the tray to their mouth. And as soon as you turn their back, your back, whoo, the spoon hits the floor. And as a mother, you're really patient. You rinse it off because you're a little germophobic. You put that on the tray. And as soon as you turn your back, whoo, it hits the floor again. Not only is the child training you to do their bidding, um, but they're actually being experimental physicists. They're discovering through play that gravity works the same way every time. Right? I throw it up and it hits the ground. Fascinating, right? That is the scientific method, right? Now, in today's education system, we spend most of our time down here in these remembering and understanding things. What year was the word 1812 put in? <laughs> right? Really fascinating, important questions. And, you know, my kids say, well, why do I need to know that? I have Google. And my daughter said, well, why do I need to learn to spell? Because I have spell check. And a lot of the things that we as kids thought were important to master, still are important to master, right? We really want kids to be able to spell. We want them to have a basis of understanding. But this stuff, understanding and remembering, is really boring. And guess what? When you learn through play, or when you are deeply engaged in something, it, those two levels take care of themselves. You don't have somebody who learns, put the spoon back up on the table, going, oh, gosh, yeah. If I put the spoon back on the table, is it actually going to hit the table? That's been predestined. It's wired in our brains. You know, today we had Andy talking about video games, and we had Ben talking about video games. If monkeys can play video games and actually learn something and begin to make decisions, I think humans can too. So this is also Bloom's taxonomy, for those of you who lived through education once upon a time. Right? And he goes in and out of favor, and he's sort of a constructivist. But he actually had some really interesting insights that are part of how we're framing the materials that we want to develop. Now, we have a tradition of using new media to educate people. And how many of you remember sitting through film strips in class where you heard, Whoo! <laughs> right? That was the thing that John Woo came up with. It's a new picture. I have to listen. That was not an excellent example of using media to engage students, right? Now, for those of you who are children in the 70s and who are trying to stay out of your parents' hair early in the morning, you might remember some cartoons that came on. And I'm going to give you the first bit, and my kids are going to mock me because I don't sing out loud, and you're going to finish it, right? Ready? One, two, three. Conjunction, junction. All right, that stuck with you better than Mr. Zogby's eighth grade English lecture, right? Who has forgotten what a conjunction is, right? You know it's about hooking up words and phrases. Now, to be fair, Mr. Zogby was an amazing English teacher, and he still lives here. And in the United States, when video games first came out, we thought they were for adolescent males, and they sat in their basements, and they played them by themselves, and they rotted their brains. Well, we actually know now that that's not true, especially if we design games to be collaborative. Right, where we bring out the best in people and we get them to work together towards solving problems in context. Gameplay is problem solving. Has anybody ever thought about it that way? When you're playing a game, and we, let's just think about the word play. We play at all kinds of things, right? We play instruments, we play sports, right? We play games, we play with each other's minds, which is probably a great thing, right? And when you're playing, when you're playing a game, you're solving a problem. 
You're trying to win. You're trying to beat a level. You're trying to master a new skill. You are actively engaged and you are leaning forward and you are thinking actively about the material that you're being challenged with. Play. What does play foster? Right? What happens when we play? We end up being immersed. When we were kids, you know, your parents would say, come in to dinner, when we were still allowed to play outside by ourselves. And, because God knows, with helicopter parenting today, we don't want our kids to play outside unattended. And we would beg for just 10 more minutes. We all lost hours in a book, or immersed in a game, or playing an instrument, just trying to get that right tone. And you know what that is? That is something that Chitsat Mahai called flow. We are sort of on that edge between challenge and mastery, and it's keeping you right on the edge of trying to accomplish something new. And it's an incredible motivator, and it's when all kinds of neural pathways are being laid down and creating great things. When we play together, we're forced to collaborate. Right? We develop social and emotional skills. We learn to be present, and we learn to listen. When else do we do that together as a society these days? Right? Not very often. The other thing that we do when we play is we explore. How does this work? We take risks. In games, there's no penalty for failure, unless it's Section 5 football and you're playing and then and plays for life. And you take risks and you begin to understand the why. And you begin to build those connections yourself so that when you are presented with that boring lecture, Right? Not all teachers are boring, by the way. I love teachers. I used to be a teacher. I know it's really hard to keep kids engaged. Um, you can unpack that material. Jim Chi talks a lot about gameplay being preparation for future learning. The other thing is, is that it gets you to be motivated, right? All of you have read Daniel Pink's material. A lot of the research was done here in Rochester on how we keep things moving, right? What's this? This is a face of an epic win. And I'm going to try and wrap this up because I'm going to go over time. Uh, we were supported by the National Science Foundation to develop an uh, interactive collaborative science game. And we tested it with urban, suburban, and rural children. And we saw something phenomenal happen. We actually saw gap closure between our urban kids and our suburban kids. 20 points in STEM affiliation scores. These kids were problem solving. They came up with solutions that PhD scientists never anticipated in the game level, right? PhD scientists were like, huh, never would have anticipated using the bear as the stock, right? And they collaborated for, and for 76% of the time that these kids were playing together, they were actively discussing physics in the game. The other thing is, is that they stay on task. For those of you who are the parents of middle school children, they were on task 95% of the time. That's amazing. For an hour of play, they were being tested like lab rats. And they felt successful. So they were engaged, they were immersed. We saw great positive learning outcomes. So I'd like to take us back to that Plato quote. Plato said that when you can learn more about a person in an hour of conversation, or you can learn more about a person in an hour of play than a year of conversation. I'd like us to think about whether or not a student can learn more in an hour of play and make that next hour of conversation with our teacher or tutor got much more productive. Thank you.